Um, I think we're going to go ahead and get started here. It's been a long-standing philosophy of mine to reward those who show up on time rather than uh, to uh, penalize them and make them wait for those who don't show up on time. So you did, and so we're going to get uh, started post-haste. Um, first order of business is to thank um, all the folks who have been working on making this uh, wonderful series happen, uh, beginning, with, of course, with Dr. Bill Hines, who has been kind enough to donate his time uh, to people of High Falls and all of you who have come from greater distances around. We want this to be a general gift to uh, not only our own hamlet, but uh, to the wider community at large. So um, we, want to, we want to thank Bill especially, and, and we also want to thank the volunteers who have uh, come every, every week and uh, been working diligently over the past few weeks uh, to organize things, um, get uh, printed pieces put together, designed, printed, um, and picked up and uh, delivered. So uh, there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes at an event like this, and uh, we just want to make sure that everybody is, is uh, aware of how grateful we are. Another individual whose name can't be dismissed is Carl Cox, standing back there in the in the back of the room. Carl is, is taping every one of his shows. Uh, so uh, eventually um, there is a possibility that they may be available to the public in general. And uh, for those of you who have left your uh, email addresses for us, if you didn't put your email address down and would like to be sure that um, you receive anything that we put out on these lectures, um, go ahead and, and make that adjustment before you leave. And, um, and, and if you decide to uh, throw something in the donation jar, that'll be okay too. We don't, we don't mind that. Um, I also want to just mention um, that um, we, we'd like to um, encourage everyone to check out the program booklet that, uh, that everyone put together here, uh, the, the project team put together, uh, that not only outlines the lectures that are, that are being presented, but also uh, provides um, uh, a poem that was written by uh, Matthew Spearling, Spearling um, and uh, uh, it's quite relevant to the topic and, and will be uh, presented to you, I believe, before the next lecture. Um, also in this booklet are uh, lists of the various uh, offerings of our restaurants and shops in High Falls. Um, we went to them asking if they'd like this to be uh, come more of a town-wide celebration and uh, have the opportunity to participate as well as uh, just uh, attend. And of course, most of them can attend because they're out uh, serving dinners in their own restaurant or whatever. Uh, and they, every single one of them stepped up to that, that request. Every single one of them is offering uh, special drinks, special dishes. Um, um, our, our own artist, Kata uh, Brittenshaw, is uh, displaying a um, piece of unique sculpture in her gallery that you can look at. It's inspired by the rock formations around the falls. Um, please read. Please read in this book. We put it together very specially uh, for you to be uh, an, an addition to what you hear. But of course, the main thing that you've come for, and the thing you're wishing I would stop talking so you can hear, is Mr. Bill Hines. And Bill, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Richard. And, and I really would like to thank Carol and Richard for putting together this, this event. I grew up in a little town in Iowa, and we had a lecture series too. And that was always a big deal to get to go hear somebody talk. So I'll try to make it worth your while and make it uh, something that you, you would like to come out for in the future. So if we go to the next slide. And please, by all means, if there, ask questions as we go along. Um, there, I'll try to leave some time for questions at the end as well. And if you have any suggestions, please come out with them. Because, so I'm gonna stand up here and I'm gonna use the mic and I got my laser pointer. All suggestions for, um, 
from last time. So last time when we all met here, we went over some basic geological principles. Uh, we tried to get a sense of how big geologic time is and what are some of the processes that make uh, the Earth work. And today we'll see those principles in action. And we'll recap a few points from last time too. But in the arc of the, of the series, we started out with that introductory bit Tonight is about the rocks of this territory. What were they like at the time they were first formed? Like when they were born. Back, we're going to look at baby pictures uh, today. Next time, we're going to see what happened to them as they were growing up. And, and like many of us, there were some traumatic events that befell our local rocks. And that's what we'll talk about next time. And then the wrap up will be. What happened, so there was a big train wreck here. I'll, 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 cut, I'll, I'll give you a little te teaser. There was a tectonic train wreck here that really messed things up. But in the 200 plus million years since then, a lot of action happened also. So the last talk in the series will be from 250 million years to this very day. But now we want to look at the baby pictures. So the, the cast of characters that we'll be looking at from bottom to top of the pile are first uh, the Schwangunk conglomerate. And you'll see that this is a measured section from nearby. So this shows you the real relative thickness of the rocks. There's the Schwangunk conglomerate. There's the High Falls Shale, the Binnewater Sandstone, and then two limestone or two carbonate units, the Rondout Formation, which is really famous, and the um, had to even, oh, the Manlius, the Manlius limestone. So go forward. And just to put some, some geologic lingo around them, the two at the top are carbonates. So there's a limestone and a dolostone. And click the next one, please. You can see the, the legend off at the left that shows you what the, um, the pattern means. And the way that you can tell these two units apart is the one on top, the Manlius limestone, has a pattern that looks like bricks. And the Rondout formation has a pattern that looks like drunken bricks that are kind of leaning over to the side. And so this, the, the leaning over bricks is the dolostone, and the regular bricks are limestone. And those two kinds of rocks are, they're different from each other based on the minerals that make them up. So the dolostone has a lot of the mineral dolomite, and the limestone has a lot of the mineral calcite. And the main difference between them is that the dolostone has a little bit of magnesium in it. And we'll see why that's important and where that came from uh, when we get a little bit deeper into the top. But the main distinction here is that the rocks at the top of the pile are carbonates. And they come about in very specific environmental conditions, which is different than the stuff in the bottom of the pot. So go to the next one. Those we refer to as clastic rocks. Um, going back to Greek, klastos, which means broken. And so these rocks are just busted up bits of other rocks that were transported by water and dumped into the ocean. Um, as, as busted up bits. And let's go to the next. We, can, we discriminate between them based on the size of the busted up pieces. So the Binnewater sandstone is a sandstone and the material, the little particles are sand size. So they're, yeah. What's under the uh, Oh, the Martinsburg Formation, also known as the Hudson River Shale. So it's another mudstone. Yep. All right, and then there's the High Falls Shale, which is a mudstone. But if we look at the pattern that it's got, we see that there's some long dashed lines, which is the same, as, which is, that's what tells you it's the mudstone. The long dashed lines are, are the geological shorthand for clay content. We'll talk about that. What? Not quite yet? <laughs> it's not the exciting part yet. And then there's little dots, which are 
it's there is a little bit of sand mixed in there but then you see that there's bricks in there too just like from the the main latest limestone so there is some carbonate content in that high falls shale so sh shale is just kind of a grab bag term that means it's a mudstone that's got a lot of other stuff in it and then the Schwangun conglomerate is gravel sized material all right so I think we're you, you got enough uh, you, we've soaked you up in, in geologic terminology and uh, iconography enough. Let's go look at some of the interesting stuff. So, for those of you who were here last week, this will be familiar. If you weren't here, this is just a little recap of what we talked about. All right, so first thing, we talked about the scale of geologic time. And if we think about all the whole history of the Earth from the time it started till today as being a football field, the oldest rocks that we have preserved on the Earth's uh, surface are a little bit younger than the, the whole history, but they're at about the three yard line. And the very earliest Earth history is kind of obscure. A lot of things have happened since the beginning. And the very, f and, and next slide please. Um, the thing that's really interesting for us is when oxygen really started accumulating in the atmosphere. And that was about halfway through all of Earth's history. Now that oxygen, and it grew more and more and more abundant in the atmosphere, and that led to the next thing, which is the Cambrian explosion, which was the real um, proliferation of multicellular life. And we saw some very odd creatures from the Burgess Shale in Canada that marked that Cambrian explosion. Next slide. So we refer to that whole bit from the, the, from the opposing goal line all the way up to about the 12 yard line as the pre-Cambrian, what came before this big explosion. And now the next slide, the post-Cambrian, um, we refer to as the Phanerozoic. And I'm just what I want to do here is just give you a little bit of vocabulary because if you read in the geologic literature or you listen to geologists talk, they refer to times in the past by names and not by numbers. And I, that's easy for me because I, I can remember somebody's name a lot better than I can remember that their social security number or their phone number or something like that. So we give names to the different pieces of time and the names actually have some sense to them. So the Phanerozoic means life that you can see. And that runs from that Cambrian explosion right up till this very day. And then we can divide that up even further into the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. If you drill down to their dead language roots, that's ancient life, middle life, and recent life. And then we can cut it down even finer than that into periods. So the Paleozoic, for example, has the periods from oldest to youngest, and I've got them stacked up in stratigraphic order. So we, the bottom of the pile is the oldest, and the top of the pile is the youngest. Got the Cambrian and the Ordovician. So these names, the Permian, some of you may recognize Perm, which is a city in the Ural Mountains. That's where rocks of this age are, are well exposed. Carboniferous is because that's when a lot of coal was created. Um, as we know, in the state of Pennsylvania, and but the state of Mississippi also has rocks of this age. And then Devon, that's a place in England, and the rest of them, the Silurii, e, the Ordovici, e, and the Cambrii, e, those were the Roman the names for some British tribes. And there's a whole history about really brutal scientific combat in the British Isles in the 1830s over what to call this stuff. So if you're, if you're interested, that, that's worth uh, checking into. Then the Mesozoic, that's a relatively brief period of time, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. And Cretaceous is because of chalk, uh, like the white cliffs of Dover are, are chalk, and uh, so they're part of the Cretaceous pile. And the reason I put this, this Greek Creta with a K is because as geologists, we, we usually use the symbol K on maps to show Cretaceous rocks. And then in the old days, um, we used to call what came after the Mesozoic. So this was the first one, this was the second one, and then the third one was the tertiary, and the fourth group 
chunk of time was the quaternary. Nowadays, we, we chunk it up a little bit differently, but there's, you know, there's names. Geologists got names for everything, even pieces of time. But you may have heard about the KT boundary, that's when the dinosaurs went away, that, and the, the K and the T comes from K for Cretaceous and T for tertiary. But now you have, you have a little bit of, of geology lingo under your belt. And I have a hard time keeping this all straight. After 40 years in the business, I kind of have all of these in my head. But to keep the, all the players straight, you need a scorecard. Oh, and sorry, before we go forward, tonight we're, oh, one more forward. Yep, tonight we're going to be talking about, mostly about Silurian rocks. And the end of the Silurian was at 419 million years. The Catskills and the other rocks that sit on top of our local stuff, that's Devonian. But we're talking about maybe eight or nine million years before this boundary. Okay, so now the next one. If you want to keep track at home with the scorecard, go to www.stratigraphy.org and you can download your very own copy and, you know, you can keep track of it at home. I have one of these on my desk. I look at it all the time because I can't keep all that stuff in my head. Okay, next. So, last time, so that was part of the geologic time that we spoke about last uh, session. We also talked about the structure of the Earth. And the mental model you can keep in, in your head is the hard-boiled egg, because that's kind of like the interior of the Earth. We have three layers. We have the crust, which is the same thickness as the thin line around the edge of the diagram. We have the mantle, which is the green part, and the core, which is the red part. And what was really important from last time is the temperature structure. That it's really hot on the inside. This, this temperature of 5200 degrees Celsius, that's almost like the surface of the sun. And the mean annual air temperature outside um, on the outside of the Earth is about 14. So it's a huge temperature difference between the inside and the outside. And that has a consequence. So what happens when you have hot on the bottom and cold on the top? You get convection. So if you have a fluid, like inside the coffee pot, or the mantle is a fluid on geologic time scales, it can move. It gets hot at the bottom where the, where the heat is, and that makes it get a little bigger. It expands, and when it expands, it's less dense, and so the more dense stuff above it gets pulled down to the bottom, and the lighter stuff that just got expanded from the heat starts going up. And we get this convection cycle that keeps, all, that keeps the mass balanced. If we go to the next one, that happens inside the Earth, too. The mantle, which is fluid on geologic time scales, heats up near the core, it rises up, and then it makes a, a, a cell. And the crust, which is much more light and buoyant, and it's floating around on the top of the mantle, it gets drug around by this convection. Where the upwelling cells are diverging, you get a mid-ocean ridge where oceanic crust is created, and then when the crust gets drug over to the side and runs into another bit of crust, some of it will go down and get recycled. So now that brings us to tonight. And we'll step into um, this, we'll take this principle under advisement and look at a very specific spot on the Earth's crust, which is the Arabian plate. All right, now I've, here's the diagram of what's going on underneath the surface. Here's the surface of the Earth. Anybody want to tell me What's what comparing here to there? Where would we find, for example, this spreading at a ridge? Going down uh, the Red Sea. And right. Going into Ethiopia and uh, Somalia. Okay. So, so we do have the Red Sea right here. Um, the Gulf of Suez up here, and uh, so that, and then. So what, who's moving which way? Um, if you take a slice down, to the right is moving to the right. So yep. Saudi Arabia is moving away from the Red Sea. Exactly. And the coast of Africa 
Sudan, Egypt, Ethiopia, and moving to the left. Exactly. So we have we have this ridge. We have the arrows going to the right like that. We have the arrows going to the left like that. Saudi Arabia is headed to the northeast. Africa is running away to the southwest. And the Red Sea is opening up as a consequence. All right, now, so Saudi Arabia is headed that way. What, how, how do we make room for it to, to go that way? Subduction. Yeah, something, so there used to be a subduction zone here. And now if we go to the next. So what we have now is we have Saudi Arabia, the Arabian plate here is on this part of the diagram. Mainland Asia, over here, the rest of Iran, is this part called the origin, or the mountain range. And you see that it's all rumpled up and folded here because of the collision. And then this bit, the collision itself, that's this band. And Saudi Arabia is, the Arabian Peninsula is a bit of, ocean, of uh, continental crust trying to get stuffed down underneath another bit of, co of uh, continental crust. And what happens, this load that's on top of the downgoing plate, it pushes down on it and it makes a hole. I mean, it pushes it down below sea level. So this area right here is called a foreland basin. This big load put on top of this plate pushes it down and so there's a little bit of accommodation space, we call it. Here you see it in, in uh, cross-section, that where you can accumulate sediments. All right, so back, oh, not quite yet. So back, back before we got to this situation, we had um, the Arabian plate and some oceanic crust that was being subducted beneath Asia. All of the oceanic crust was consumed. It all went away. That was easy to go down the trench. And then uh, the Arabian plate ran into the rest of Asia, and we didn't have a trench anymore. We just had this Portland basin where the edge of the continental crust got pushed down. And now we go forward, and this is exactly what was happening in our neighborhood 430 million years ago. In this case, Asia, or the, the the overriding continental bit was called Avalonia, and it's sitting out here outboard. North, the rest of North America is over here, and this uh, skinny ocean, that's the Foreland Basin. That's the part where North America got shoved down by the big weight that was slid up on its edge, and that made enough room to start accumulating sediments. Now, let's see what kind of sediments we're filling in this hole. Let's go to the next one. So we'll go back to our stratigraphic chart. We got the Schwanga conglomerate on the bottom. And what does that actually look like in real life? This is what you see driving on uh, Highway 213 at the intersect. The deli is just off to your left, going out of uh, you know a few gnomes for uh, <laughs> for decoration. But this is what the Schwanga conglomerate looks like today. But what did it look like at the time it was deposited? So it is, it's a gravel, and it, some parts of it look like what we see today, where there are high mountain ranges that are going up very quickly, and they erode, and they spew out the gravel from their canyons into a thing called an alluvial fan. And then this alluvial fan, the gravel gets transported a little bit farther and gets into a river system. We go, and those are called braided rivers. And braided rivers have some common characteristics. First one is that the load of sediment is way more than the usual amount of water can move. So th this river has a really hard job to try to move all that sediment that's being puked out of the big mountains. And it can only move a little bit at a time. And so the little bit of water that's most of the time in the, in the riverbank can only do a little bit of work now and then. So it's, it's just, and you see that it, it changes course all the time. And it, it meanders back and forth. And it, it kind of, we call it a braided river because this um, uh, course, the, the main channel could just kind of go back and forth and, and sometimes it's here and sometimes it's there and sometimes it splits. But 
this is a, the kind of river that then deposited and reworked all of that gravel um, across the local, the local landscape. If we go to the next one. So today, if you go up into the Shuanggang Mountain, you can see where it's all been eroded by glaciers. You can see the same kind of sedimentary structures that we see in braided rivers today. The gravel-sized material is all um, little quartz pebbles, and that means that it's, it's a really tough and abrasive rock, and it's been used, for example, in millstones uh, historically in, in the region. So that was, that's the Shuanggang conglomerate. Um, what it looked like then. So now we're still in the clastic unit and those big mountains that created the gravel that puked out into the alluvial fan, they started getting worn away and we didn't have the big, the big chunks left anymore. We just had the littler chunks like sand and mud. Now the high fall shale, if we go to the next slide, here's, here's those two units, the, the latter two clastic units that um, high fall shale is underneath and the bin of water sandstone is over top. This is the famous anticlinal fold that makes the uh, logo for the High Falls Conservancy. And it's just across, if you go stand at the power plant and look across, there's a lot more trees there today, but that, that's what you'd see. And just uh, to give you the inside geology code, secret code, S in this case is for Silurian. You remember that was one of the periods and that's the age of these rocks. And then the little H is for High Falls and the little B is for Binawad. Right, so that's what they look like today. What did they look like when they were born? Next slide. So now we go to another restricted ocean. The tectonic setting is a little bit different, but the, the geography is quite, quite the same as we had uh, here in our neighborhood. We have this long, skinny bit of ocean, um, and it's getting filled in from the end, just like we saw in the Arabian Gulf, and just like we see in today's uh, Bay of Fundy. And you can see these rivers up here. I, it's not, maybe not so clear at this uh, scale, but you can see that they're brown, that the rivers are brown. These are really muddy rivers, and they leave behind these mud flats. And that's, that's what the High Falls Shale was. It was rivers carrying big loads of mud, dumping them out into that restricted bay that looks a lot like the Arabian Gulf. Um, and that, that's what the landscape was. All right, so then, and after that mud sits around for a few tens of millions of years, and it has a lot of other uh, sediment deposited on top of it, it starts getting cooked up into a rock and the characteristic of the rock is that it comes apart in thin sheets. Here's some, here's some organic rich um, mudstone from elsewhere in the Appalachian Basin. Um, here's a local example of a mudstone that's been cooked up. And here's a photomicrograph of a, this is actually the Union Flats uh, formation. It's another mudstone nearby. The scale bar here is 500 micrometers. So it's half of a, that scale bar is half of a millimeter. So you can see that the individual particles that make up this sedimentary rock are really, really teeny tiny. They're just a few microns to tens of microns a piece. And the yellow stuff that you see is, are the shells of very small uh, organisms called ostracods. And you can tell that they've had a, a whole lot of weight put on their head because they all just got squashed flat. But this, this photomicrograph reinforces the idea that the little particles that make up the rock and the fragments of the shells are all kind of like leaves. And they all lie just like the leaves fall off of your tree and they lie on your, on your lawn and they all kind of lie with their flat, surface parallel to the ground, same thing happens with the, the particles in this rock, and whether it's at a microscopic level or a macroscopic level or a landscape level, the consequence is that these rocks fall apart in sheets. And in fact, the clay minerals that make up um, this, this rock are called phyllosilicates. So, any rock that's got silica, aluminum, and oxygen in it, that's a, a silicate, 
Um, and these ones are called phyllosilicates for the same reason that we call phyllo dough. It's like thin sheets. So those minerals, their natural orientation or their natural habit is thin sheets, and so they pile up like the leaves on your, your lawn, and that's what makes this characteristic um, <coughs> nature of the mud rocks. All right, and, and clay, if it gets wet, is slippery, and that is going to be an important fact for next time. So just, you know, put that in your hip pocket. Part of the reason that the landscape around here looks like it does is because the mudstones are slippery when you, sh when you push on them. All right, next one. So then going a little farther up the pile, how about the Binawater sandstone? That was deposited in an area where a river meets the ocean. So it's the transition from a river, with the, that's a fluvial, fluvial is the adjective to describe the river environment, and then the delta that you get where the river builds its sediment out into the standing body of water. And if you go look at the Binawater sandstone, you can see it all along the Wallkill Valley Rail Trail. You can see it all along Binawater Road. I mean, that's why it's called Binawater sandstone, because it's on Binawater Road. Um, and you can see a lot of ripple marks. You can find um, many kinds of sedimentary structures that are consistent with what you would see deposited in this fluvial deltaic environment today. Okay, let's go. Oh, and if we if we uh, slice up the rock, I mean, geologists are kind of bloodthirsty folks. Um, that one of my personal pastimes actually is slicing up sandstones into really thin layers and polishing them so thin that that you can see through them with light, and it, they're they're really quite beautiful in my opinion. But some other folks have done that as well, um, these guys. And what you see in the Binnenwater sandstone is first that there, it's, it's pretty poorly sorted. So there are some big chunks and there are some little chunks and there are some really teeny tiny chunks that can all fit in between. Here the scale bar is 200 microns. This is so that we would say that these, this is fine to medium sand. And because it's relatively poorly sorted, you can pack in a lot of grains and there's not a whole lot of open space. And once this thing gets buried deep enough and heated up high enough, those grains start recrystallizing. And here you see that each individual particle, they're, they're starting to grow. They're starting to get um, crust on the outside of them. And so they, the individual sand grains start um, coalescing because of these, the crust on them and there's just no empty space left uh, between them. All right. Yes? Could you describe a little bit um, how much of it is turning the mud into rock was the pressure? How much was heat? What, what was the heat? Heat is the more important um, aspect of the, of the transformation. What kind of heat? What kind of pressure? Yeah. So the normal geothermal gradient is 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer or three degrees Celsius, which is about uh, five and a half degrees Fahrenheit per 10 meters. So over, over 30, over 30, as you go down into the earth, just generally speaking, it gets about three degrees C hotter for every 100 meters that you go down. So the, the maximum burial depth on these guys is maybe two kilometers. So we would expect it to get to about 60 degrees C. That's, uh, let me do that quick, um, 120, 108, that's about 140 degrees. So, you know, it's hot enough that you might, it, you know, there's some kind of wacko turkey uh, roasting recipes, you know, the low, the low and slow turkey recipe. That's about how hot it got. It's inducing a chemical reaction. Yes, yes. So the pressure, the overlying pressure, and again, to, to answer your question, it's about um, one PSI per foot. So you increase the pressure on your head by one pound per square inch every foot you go down in a normal rock pile. And that, the consequence of the extra pressure is to scooch everybody closer together. It just squishes, physically squishes the grains together and then the temperature starts cooking it up. And if, if we go back one, you see the white arrows on that that are showing some little brighter rims around some of the grains, that's where the, the cements are starting to grow at that spot. There was another question over here. Thank you. 
think he sort of answered it with that question. But that that increase in temperature is due to overlying pressure increase or proximity to the mantle being molded. Proximity to the mantle. So the heat that's flowing out from the hot interior of the Earth, it gets a little boost along the way uh, from the radioactive decay of potassium in the mantle. Uh, but that, that's where most of the heat comes from. Yep. You Any said 3 degrees centigrade for every kilometer? No, 30. 30 per kilometer. 30, 30 degrees, so it's 3 degrees per 100 meters. And that's, that's average. I mean, it, some places it's more, some places it's less. But, yeah. Yes? Caves always have a temperature range from the high 40s to the high 50s yeah. Why is that? What, what does? Caves. Oh, caves. Yeah, so um, the earth has, the earth materials have what we would call thermal inertia. So if you apply heat to them, it takes a while for them to heat up. <coughs> And when you take the heat away, it takes a while for them to cool off. And so as you go deeper and deeper into the Earth, you feel the fluctuation of the air temperature less and less. Just because you know the forcing of the air temperature, whether it's a high temperature like 80, 90 degrees like it's been lately during the day, or even during the winter it gets down below zero, that the effect of those temperature variations dampens out as you go deeper into the earth. And so when you get down by about 10 meters, you're at just the average. You know, so, and, and the average temperature here, right here, the average air temperature, if you average over the whole year, is about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the temperature that you find down in the relatively shallow subsurface. The, the, this geothermal gradient of 30 degrees per, th that you don't start perceiving that until you're about 10, 20 meters deep. Is bluestone a form of mudstone? Bluestone is a sandstone. And, and it's one of the reasons it's so dang strong. If we back up one, the binna water is not that much different from, from the bluestone, but it is relatively poorly sorted, so you could pack the grains really tightly together because there's room between the big ones, there's room to snuggle the little ones in. And then it also, over, over in, um, uh, like, I guess the northernmost part of Marble Town and up, up where the bluestone quarries are, there, those uh, rocks have been buried at least four kilometers. So they really got squashed and cooked. And that's, that's why the bluestone is so tough. And also, some of the mineral grains that are in there, this one, the binna water, is mostly quartz. But those rocks up there have a lot of other kinds of uh, rock fragments in them that are squishier. And they can, when you, when you push on them, they really snuggle up together. They, they indent into each other, and they become mechanically very strong. Okay, so now we get to the get to kind of the the local, um, the real stars of the local landscape, which are the carbonate units at the top, and they're exposed dramatically in high falls. So the two carbonate units are there where the water is cascading over. So let's look at what those rock. That's what they look like today. What did they look like originally? So we're going to take a trip to the Caribbean. And we're going to zoom in on these bunches of islands, which are mostly made out of limestone, just like you find here. But before we get there, I want to make a little digression to say something about sea level. Now, you can, you can see that this picture, the darker blue colors are the deeper ocean, and the lighter blue colors are shallower. And you can see that there's a very dramatic break right along there. And if we go to the next. Uh, slide. I, you may be able to see that I've highlighted that with a blue line, and that is actually where the shoreline was at the last glacial maximum. So when big ice sheets covered the continents, the water that was in that ice had to come from somewhere. It came out of the ocean. So the water evaporated from the ocean, went into clouds, and it came down as snow on the continents. It was so cold that it stayed there as solid ice, and it wasn't in the ocean anymore. 
As a result, the ocean level, sea level, was 400 feet lower than it is today, and that's where the shoreline was. Now, before we go to the next one, I, I think you can see on the landscape there's a little white, kind of a white rim there. That's like a bathtub ring. And now, if you go to the next one, I've highlighted that bathtub ring represents where the, the shoreline was at the hottest part of the Cretaceous. You remember that was the, the time period right before the dinosaurs died. There were no ice caps at all. There was no glaciers, there was no continental ice, there was no Antarctic ice sheet, no Greenland, nothing. All that water was in the ocean. It was liquid. And because of that, the sea level was about 400 feet higher than it is today. So, ice caps really matter. And if we do something that melts the ice caps, that can have serious consequences for us. All right, so that, that's just a little digression. But it's also important to understand something about carbonate deposition. So now let's go back to the Caribbean. And we're gonna focus in on the Turks and Caicos Islands, which is a really famous place for carbonate geologists. If, if anybody studies uh, carbonates in graduate, graduate school or you work at an oil company and you wanna study carbonate rocks, you want to know how they were made, you take a trip to the Tur Turks and Caicos. Next one. So here's, we're zoomed in, close up. Now, I mean, you all know, at least in your mind's eye, what that ought to look like. Next one. And, and of course, that's really why people go there for the field trip. Um, but let's, let's uh, go to the next slide. And what's happening is that calcium ions and carbonate ions are hooking up in this warm, shallow water. So, I have to prove to you that I'm a real scientist. That's why I put, you know, chemical formula up there. But this is really a, a very simple thing. So, calcium is a metal, and if you dissolve it and ionize it, it is lacking two electrons. That's what this two plus means. It has an imbalance between in its electrical charge. In its nucleus, it's got some protons, and in its electron shell outside, it's got not enough by two electrons. So it needs electrons. Carbonate, on the other hand, is an ion. When you dissolve CO2 in water, and you get, it is a, a, an ion that's running around with two extra electrons. And so this beautiful thing happens in the water, they share. They share their two electrons and they're happy and they make calcium carbonate and it's a stable compound. Now, the reason that they're able to get together in this kind of environment are there are several things working to their advantage. First one, we have high evaporation at this low latitude, warm, tropical climate that is concentrating the ions. So when you take the water away, there's less room for these guys to run away from each other and they bump into each other more commonly. Second thing is that the warm temperature decreases the solubility of the compound once it's together. Now our intuition, you think about your coffee in the morning, you put a spoonful of sugar in there and it dissolves. You know, you think that and you put it in iced tea and it's harder to dissolve it. So for sugar, solubility increases with increasing temperature. Carbonate is the other way around. At the hotter and hotter the water gets, the less soluble is that compound. That's why you get scale in your hot water pipes in your house, or why you get scale in your teapot, because it's less soluble at the higher temperatures. So, the high temperature of this tropical water promotes the, um, the precipitation of the CO2. And then, you get help from the critters because clams and snails and anybody who's got a shell, they build that shell out of calcium carbonate because the raw materials are readily available in seawater. And those, those critters aren't stupid. They say, I mean, it's free, it's very easy to get, I'm gonna build my shell out of that. And they provide biological energy that enhances uh, the, the formation of calcium carbonate. So you put all those things together and you get the deposition of limestones in this kind of environment, in a warm, shallow marine environment. Yes? Calcium carbonate, used to be, I believe, used to be used as fuel in miners' lamps. We had water 
Oh, carbide lamp. Calcium, took, yeah. calcium carbide. Calcium carbide. That's different? That's different. Okay, sorry. No problem. Yep. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Now, so both the Rondout Formation, which is the lower one, and the Manlius Limestone, which is the upper one, both of them were born in the same way. But they didn't grow up the same. They are not the same critter. And clearly, the Rondout Formation is much more desirable. So, if, oh, if I was going to go first this one and that. That doesn't matter. If you walk across the Rosendale Railroad Trestle today, going towards Joppenburg Mountain, this is what you'll see. But if you were standing on that same rail trestle back in 1888, you would have seen a big cement mine. And the miners, you can tell, they, they were working really hard and they were mining very diligently, but they stopped right at that line. And the reason they stopped at that line is because they only wanted rondout formation. They did not need manlius. That was no manlius was not useful. So obviously the rondout formation had some kind of extra secret sauce that made it more useful, and that was magnesium. So we we talked about the difference between the dolostone and the limestone is that little extra bit of magnesium in there. Now magnesium is just like calcium. You dissolve it in water, it's got two less electrons, it really needs, it really wants its two electrons back, so it hooks up with carbonate to make the mineral. Just the mineral is shaped a little bit different um, because of the, the substitution of the magnesium. All right, so, but how did the magnesium get there? Next one. That is a matter of some dispute among geologists. Now, we are, Generally speaking, fairly polite. We don't get into fisticuffs, but there is some uh, hefty dispute in the scientific literature about exactly how dolomitization happens. Like, what's the process that changes a normal limestone into a dolomitized limestone that has this extra magnesium in it? And it's the magnesium that makes the, Ron the Rosendale cement so wonderful. Okay, let's take a look. And I would say there, there's two basic schools of thought. One says that the magnesium is coming in as a result of concentrated brines due to evaporation. It's coming in from the seawater from the top and then filters through the limestone and does its magic after it filtered downward. The other camp says that this uh, fluid flow is coming from the bottom. And you know, whether you're a top down or a bottom up, uh, that's a matter of great dispute. Go on to the next. But everybody can agree that this kind of dead end, um, shallow, high, uh, low latitude, hot, um, restricted ocean, that's a good place for dolomitization to happen. And so now we can wrap up with why. Uh, why did I pick this particular spot as the, you know, the, the Arabian Gulf as the analog for here? So now we see that just in the same way that you have this restricted ocean at about 28 degrees north latitude, that compares very favorably with this long dead end ocean at, at the time, way back in, in the day, at 28 degrees south latitude. So if you want to imagine what was the environment like when the Schwanga conglomerate, the High Falls Shale, the Binnewater Sandstone, and the two carbonate units, the um, Rondout and the Manlius, they were all deposited into a shallow, tropical, um, hot, bounded by big mountains um, environment, very much like the Arabian Gulf of today. So, now you know what, where did these rocks come from? How were they created? What was the environment that they lived in? Next week, oh, that, that's just an extra, that's a, a zoom in of that. I, I was gonna take that out. All right, next week, we're gonna see what happened to them after that. And here's a, here's a geological map made by Newton Shute back in 1952. And you can see all these stripy colors. 
the um, we'll, we can zoom in on the on the map next time, and you'll see that it's the same stratigraphic column that we looked at today, but the different colors represent the different rock units, and originally they were all flat lying on top of each other. But today we see this stripy pattern on the geologic map, and if you look at it in cross section, it looks like you know somebody skidded on the carpet and and folded it all up. And indeed, that's what happened. And next time we'll talk about exactly the uh, tectonics responsible for this. Yes? You said that this inland water was at 32 degrees south. 28, 28 about 28. Yep. 28 degrees south. Yes. So it migrated all the way from there to here. Over, over the course of uh, 420 million years, yes. Okay. I, I didn't Okay. Yeah, and, that, and, and we can, I can play the movie again. Um, I, I only have 300 million years worth of, of the movie. It was running uh, in, the, in the background when we were coming. So yeah, here's the, here's the map we'll zoom into next time. New York State Geological Survey open file number. Um, but yeah, there's the same, the same uh, stratigraphic column that we were looking at from the Schwangunk conglomerate up to the Nanleus limestone. And you can see here in the local area, just how uh, crunched up it has become. And we'll look at next time what that's about. And that's it.